What a great start. Stop the bleed. Uh, actually, it's new to us, but not new to Emma. Uh, Stop the bleed is a massive campaign which started in the States um, and has now spread to about 90 different countries, uh, including Australia, many of the other countries we compare ourselves with in Denmark. Basically, it was a recognition by the Obama uh, presidency that after these massive shootings, mass shooting instances in the USA, that actually a lot of these victims were dying even before the emergency services came on scene. And with just a little bit of intervention <coughs> from a bystander, we can actually save about 50% of, of these victims from exsanguination, massive hemorrhage, hence stop the bleed. So we uh, thought we'd take this concept. We're going to take it one step further. We're going to take it through to both the pre-hospital setting when we have our good colleagues working pre-hospitally, in the hospital setting, in the trauma unit, in the, in the admissions unit, on the intensive care, radiology, the theatres, and go through the whole spectrum of Stop the Bleed. <coughs> to help me do that, I have got some really great uh, colleagues here. First colleague, Kate Pryor. She is a surgeon captain in the Royal Navy. She has seen a lot of, uh, she has had military postings in Iraq, Afghanistan. She's also been in Sierra Leone and the South Sudan. When she's not doing her naval work, she works at the uh, King's College Hospital, one of the four major trauma centers in London. And she has been so kind to give her time to us today and come and talk to us and help us with this Stop the Bleed talk. Sitting next to her is uh, a gentleman, I don't think he needs an introduction, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, his name is Simon, no. Are you ready? <laughs> One, two, three, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jakob Seesballer. Jakob is, uh, I mean, it's quite phenomenal what Jakob has done in this, in this field. 15 years ago, Jakob, together with his good colleague, our good colleague, Per Johansson, started the Copenhagen concept up. This is the concept of transfusing, massive transfusion strategies, massive transfusion protocols, call them what you will, but a more sensible way to transfuse these patients. Jakob has produced yeah, over 100 articles uh, in this field. He has uh, implemented viscoelastic assays to Denmark. He has also uh, been on the international lecture, lecture circuit for many years. As well as this, he's partly employed in the blood bank. He has a part-time employment in the anaesthetic uh, operations, operating theatres here as an anaesthetist, works in the trauma bay, works pre-hospitally. I'm amazed he's actually got time to come sit with us today, but we're incredibly pleased he has. Next to him is another good colleague, Mikkel. Mikkel is a uh, associate professor uh, in, in, in the radiology department and has a clinical lecture in the uh, Copenhagen University. He works with me and Emma and Jakob on the DSTC collaboration, which is a collaboration between anaesthetists, intensivists and surgeons training in a multidisciplinary environment to treating patients who come in multiple trauma. He is a really good friend to know when you want to stop the bleed in an elegant way. And we'll come back to that a bit later. <laughs> See, next to him is Emma. Emma is also a fantastic colleague who works here at Risk Hospital. She's a trauma surgeon. She is chair of the ATLS, of also of DSTC, DSATC, yeah. and uh, often seen in the trauma bay in the intensive care unit here at Risk Hospital. So thank you all much for your time and energy. I've already done far too much talking. So we go on to the first slide. And this is a paradigm shift. All of you have heard ABC. Kate, can you tell us about this CABC? This is something new. Well, not that new nowadays. Uh, we decided we needed to rewrite the alphabet with our experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan because our casualties were getting blown up and they were losing multiple limbs. And if we didn't stop the bleed promptly, they'd be dead long before they got to hospital. So the first C is for catastrophic hemorrhage. And if your patient's missing three limbs, they will bleed out into the mud long before their airway ever becomes a problem. So we rewrote the alphabet. It now starts with big C. Great, thank you. And the um, the A, the small, the new ABC, which are trying to, which is being taught in this Stop the Bleed campaign. I don't know one of you would like to, Emma. You are actually 
we've just found out. Yeah, I think actually I'm the first Danish uh, Stop the Bleed official instructor trained in Washington. <laughs> and uh, by the way, this wasn't planned. We found this out <laughs> 10 minutes ago before we started talking. This is this is bonus information. Tell us a bit about it. What is the what are the small ABCs for our pre-hospital providers? Do, do you mean the small ABC when you when you start to, you know, with the uh, with the uh, airway breathing circulation? No, I'm talking thing? about the ones with when you come onto a scene, you're a bystander. Um, this is the whole point of the Stop the Bleed campaign. So a bystander comes on the scene, hasn't got any medical knowledge, but they can do some things and they do it in an ABC series. So the first thing you do is obviously make the scene safe. Yeah, you stop the, stop, you stop the accident. <laughs> yeah. And then the next thing, the A is for alerting the medical services. B, look for... Bleeding. Bleeding, thank you. And C, for... Yeah, for compression and tourniquets. Compression and tourniquets. <laughs> and this is all a part of the campaign. And it's actually one of these things that's been, as I said, we've been using again and again and again, simple measures to help, to help these patients. Now, Yakov, this is an unfortunate, uh, unfortunate gentleman. He was, um, he was involved in a water sports accident. He was a propeller severed his arm. Can you maybe just tell us about the trauma mechanism here and, and what has been done in this case by a bystander? Because there are, no, there are none of our colleagues on site at the moment. I think it's again acknowledging that uh, stopping the bleed is probably the most important thing by kind of reducing the risk of kind of downstream effects of this, you know, coagulopathy is important, but actually the best treatment is to stop the bleed or mm. to avoid further exsanguination. Mm. So, so again, for us to rewrite the you know, alphabet CABC is actually about putting coagulopathy up there, stopping the bleed, you know, mm. putting efforts into that. And this is what we see, that we actually see the, the, the risk of bleeding from uh, in, in trauma is actually causing a, a, a lower mortality in cities that has actually implemented the highest level of care. So we see a, a, a reduction in mortality from bleeding trauma. Yeah, excellent. And, what is, I mean, the, the, and the thing we all think about trauma patients, patients dying, but as you could probably tell us, the mortality of trauma occurs where? Actually, uh, 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 a proportion of them die in pre-hospital setting, but this has mm. actually been reduced a lot by stopping the bleeding by putting pre-hospital transfusions, tranexamide act acid mm. out there to support patients arriving in hospital, yeah. arriving alive in order to get to the surgeon to kind of continue the resuscitation. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, what we want to do, our, our, our organization, um, is to create a community and also a lot of the time we want to actually come over the, obviously out to you guys but also we want you to disseminate, disseminate the information that you learn here and what we've done I think coming down the sides of I mean, there'll be some people dishing out some Christmas presents so what we've got hold of is some uh, small presents from uh, it is almost Christmas it's about enough for half of you in the audience there are small uh, bleeding tool uh, simple bleeding tool kits uh, which, you've, if, you know, if you get hold of one, you think you'll never use that. Um, if you give it to your neighbor, be altruistic. If, you're gonna, if you want to use it, then take it home, put it in your rucksack and take it out, or in the car, or take it out with you. But these bleeding kits, you can see actually our sponsor has uh, got a bleeding model. Many of you might have seen it out in the foyer. But they're actually quite, uh, quite simple things to prevent, hem prevent uh, massive hemorrhage, ongoing hemorrhage in the pre-hospital setting before the medical emergency teams have arrived. This is the algorithm from uh, the Stop the Bleed campaign. Um, and uh, we're now a bit of a dichotomy here in the room because 50% of you have got the bleeding kits, 50% of you haven't. <laughs> Sorry. But there's good news because I think this, this algorithm will actually explain that you don't need these, you don't actually need these kits, you can actually use other things. I think, uh, Kate, would you like to tell us, because your experience in the military setting, um, some, obviously, Quite a lot of the time, I expect you have these kits, but when you don't have them, there is a dichotomy in this algorithm to help us achieve the goal. Can you explain a little bit about this? I think there's a lot of improvisation that we can do. Mm. You know, you're all wearing lanyards around your neck. Strap-ons. Not what that means. <laughs> <laughs> oh, neck straps. Sorry, neck straps. <laughs> Gosh, well. Um, I mean, you're all wearing lanyards with your, your conference badge on. You can improvise. That could be the start of your tourniquet. Yeah. Excellent. So you, yeah, and other things, just a, a T-shirt, rip a T-shirt up to compress 
to bleed. What, what things can we, uh, Emma, what things can we put a tourniquet on? You can, you, you can put a tourniquet on the extremities. I think you can get a tourniquet above that, that will say arms mm. and legs. Uh, the, the real problem starts when it's in the torso or in the, but the bleeding is from there. But mm. otherwise, a tourniquet could be a good thing. And we can actually see, and the patients we see in the trauma bay today, that uh, more and more patients actually arrive with tourniquets on. Uh, that can be an easy, life-saving procedure uh, at tourniquets. Mm. And I think one of the things about this Stop the Bleed campaign uh, is the awareness for the bystanders mm. that they actually can do something, that it's not dangerous to try to do something. And I think this, this is one of the most important things with the Stop the Bleeding campaign, mm. as there is with, with cardiac compressions, with, with cardiac arrest. This mm. is the awareness of it. Yeah, exactly. Mm. We talked about... Uh, this uh, bystander, obviously CPR, just before we start the talk, we were talking about, we had some comments, Jaco, about bystander. Yeah. You have some, uh... yeah, I think we have moved a long way. You know, in Denmark, we are kind of uh, among the five, five countries, I guess, that is, have a very good history now of being bystanders in kind of medical cardiac arrest. We actually now have a population that actually takes uh, part, takes responsibility, takes action in this. And I guess this is the this is what we need to kind of uh, empower again. Uh, but is it actually necessary for getting stop the bleed kits out there? Do we actually need to educate the Danish population about uh, stop the bleed? I'm not sure about that because we actually have a very strong collaboration with the police. The police in Denmark are educated for stopping the bleed. So every policeman actually have tawny case and bandages and are aware of this. And actually they see it as a very high priority task for them to stop the bleed. And this is why, as Emma said, in the hospital setting early on arrival, many of these patients arrive with uh, the early stop the bleed treatment and that is initiated by police. So we are very fortunate in Denmark. So in my mind, we don't need that for the population just to challenge this point a little bit. Yeah. We need to ensure that the police continue the work. We need to ensure that the paramedics get forward, the immediate response get forward and take part in, in treatment of these patients. So I'll challenge you back because I think it is an important to be aware of this. Um, the camp, for example, we're not the, the police actions you're talking about. Uh, the police need to be called out to them. Um, if you're in a provincial town in Denmark, how quickly will they come out? Mm. Contra, how quickly will you bleed down from a severed limb mm. or a, 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 a lesion in your femoral artery? So I think there is some 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 role I believe mm. to play for this campaign. Mm. Um, yes, Emma. I think it's one thing we have learned the population that not be that afraid with a cardiac arrest. Mm. Mm. They they are not freaked out. Blood freak people out yeah. a lot. They get afraid, they run away, it gets dirty, you get the, mm. everything about that. And that's one thing I think we can maybe remove something, we give them some easy tools to, to handle. Yeah. yeah. I think that's right, because I think people see bad stuff happening to a family member, a friend, a stranger on the street, and you're right, it's the blood. There's that, oh, I don't mm. want to get involved in this. And actually empowering people to get their hands on that casualty will mm. make a difference. Yeah. Okay. We're talking about... Uh, this is another, it's the same algorithm from, the, it's a different algorithm, but it's, uh, it's again from the same, the Stop the Bleed campaign. And, and one of the things is about the, uh, like talk about the tourniquet, very quickly, where, where do we place the tourniquet? Because there's, the, someone told me it's 10 centimetres above, 13 centimetres, how tight do we do it? Um, what's the point of writing the time on it? It's, uh, could you maybe explain to that as well? So, uh, yeah, of course, uh, of course, you, you should put the tourniquet place above the injury and it should stop the bleed <laughs> that's the reason so if you you pull the tourniquet until they stop to bleed and uh, then you have the effect on it and why would you write the time because we don't we don't want to use an orthopedic surgeon afterwards to remove the limb we want to use a vascular surgeon or a ordinary general surgeon so we want to make sure that the tourniquet doesn't mm. is there too long a time yeah. And time is a blurred thing after one of those heavy traumas. Mm -hmm. right. With regard to this slide as well, there's, um, one of the things I often get caught up in is if you, if you see something that says pre-hospital or hospital, you think, oh, I can only do it in the pre-hospital setting. Um, <laughs> we had a couple of cases in our ward with patients who come with femoral artery lesions for bleeding to death, and we tried all the things, you know, put, put, the, put the pressure on and, and didn't really work. At the end of the day, you, you can actually get a colleague to sit on the bed Put manual pressure on the on the femoral artery and stop the bleed, and then wheel them both off into the theatres. 
And it's one of those things just go, I get caught up in something. You see an algorithm for one place, and you, you, you fix on that one place and on that situation. So this also reminds me of, you know, we, we can also do this in hospital, and we should be doing it as well. Good. We've, uh, that was a bit about Stop the Bleed campaign and uh, how we uh, approach that as a, as a healthcare community and how we like to you know, highlight this a bit more. Now moving into what happens when the emergency services turn on. This is a really nice slide that Jakob has donated to us. Uh, all the people on the slides actually have given their accept to be on here, just to orientation. Jakob, this is a, you, yeah, this is what you come out to. With regard to Stop the Bleed, what are your thoughts here when you come out to this, this scene? I mean, maybe you should explain what it is, because it's actually quite difficult to see what's mm. going on. This is a right side uh, accident. There's a turn of a truck, uh, there's a cyclist, and it's, it's a really challenging accident. So it's kind of a classical accident where there's severe potentially unsurvivable injury, and that's bleeding is, is the main problem. So again, a patient like this, uh, stop the bleed, ensure that patient can, can manage the situation, that's sedation and so on. And as you can see, this is actually a picture back from 2010 when we implemented pre-hospital blood transfusions in Denmark, mm -hmm. especially in the capital of, of Copenhagen. So this is actually showing you RBC transfusion below a truck mm -hmm. in a situation like this. Yeah. Okay, so high energy trauma, she's entrapped. Important mm -hmm. things here, obviously, pain control, analgesia, yeah. and then obviously start, start, start the blood. As pain control, I think a lot of the time we, we haven't talked much about it, but in children as well, what is the rationale? Of it? A lot of the time we say we give them, a, we give them some painkillers and the whole system crashes. They, 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 any considerations there when you're out on this, this sort of patient, any sort of drugs you would or wouldn't use, um, any worries about dosing of drugs in this sort of situation? I think dosing is the main question. All the drugs that we have actually can you know, potentially damage the patient if you increase the dose too much. So all the drugs that we have that is potentially all the different types of painkillers, sedation and so on, can kill the patient. So you have to go down in dose. Mm -hmm. And much of the research now actually supports that patients with hypovolemic shock actually bleeding we have to try to keep them breathing, keep them on spontaneous circulation and respiration in order to ensure that they can actually breathe. If they can this in, in some way, they will actually potentially have a higher uh, probability of survival. Yeah. So, so again, titration is, yeah. is the bottom line. So I don't know if you agree, Kate, you, what we're saying is it doesn't matter what you're using as long as you're comfortable using it and you know the dosing. I think familiarity with the drugs we use is probably one of the most important things, but absolutely mm. cut the doses down mm. on the severely injured patient. Yeah. Excellent. May I comment on the picture as well? I know it's a pre-hospital. Oh. <laughs> Go on then. <laughs> it's a pre-hospital picture uh, yeah. of a severely damaged pre uh, patient. But I think this picture is so important for us working inside the hospital as well. Mm. Because if, if I were on call and uh, got a picture sent to my phone with this, saying this, this patient's coming to you in, uh, in 20 minutes, then I will go from DEFCON 1 to 5. Yeah. I will alert the OR, I will alert the scrub nurses, yeah. so I will be able to do surgery on him yeah. as he comes. I, th I think for us working in hospital, yeah, I, if we could have sent those pictures, I yeah. think that's important. Yeah. The picture speaks a thousand words, exactly. Yeah. One of the other um, interesting things that have changed within probably, I don't know, is it right in the last 10 or 15 years is this, this paradigm shift. Um, I know one of our good colleagues, Steinmetz, are you in the audience? Yeah, he's at the top there. He's got a good, uh, good story about BMWs with uh, lower suspension alloy wheels and survival from hospital. Can, can you remember that one, Jakob? Mm, yeah. uh, can you explain what the concept is here? Actually, uh, you know, again, remembering that patients bleeding, they actually need to get to somewhere we can stop the bleed. Of course, you can uh, initiate the stop the bleed compress, tourniquets, and so on. But many of these patients, they need to go to hospital to get to the surgeon, get to the anesthetist, get to the team. So again, recognizing that time is of essence here. Getting patients away from the scene of the accident. Mm. Much of the research done, and that's by Jakob Steinmetz and good colleagues here, have shown also from the capital of Copenhagen that for every procedure you do in penetrating trauma, you increase the survive, uh, increase the mortality. Mm -hmm. So again, acknowledging that one of the main parts of being there at the scene is to get the patient on the way, yeah. get them to the hospital, get them to the surgeon, get them to a place where we can actually do the final therapy. Because I think a lot of people here might be, 
there was, we used to perform, or there was a tendency to do lots of procedures pre hospital including very drastic like thoracotomies as well. Mm. Um, Kate, was your experience of that? Did, uh, are you still doing that pre hospitally in your pre hospital setting? or? Uh, in the military, we tend not to do pre hospital thoracotomies, but I work in London, and London's air ambulance, they will do resuscitative thoracotomies mm. if they think it's the right thing to do for the patient, and they do have successful outcomes. Mm. But it's interesting about talking about scene time. There's a paper from the States, I can't remember who wrote it, sorry, that looks at uh, mortality in patients who are dropped off at the hospital by their friends or their family, and they're known mm. as drop offs, you know, and they arrive at the front door doing their best to bleed to death, but they actually do quite well when they've been picked up by their friends and brought straight to the hospital. Yeah. So the, again, just to reflect, the faster they get in the hospital, the, the, the better, they, better their survival is. So, great. Now, when we're on site, there's also been a change. Now, I know there's a big difference in the military and the civilian setting here. What fluids we should be giving, what fluids we shouldn't be giving, um, how much, how much these fluids we should give. Now, Kate, there is in the military setting a a use of a product of the walking blood banks, as it's called, that we, we don't see in the civilian, or we, we haven't seen it as yet. I'm going to ask Jakob about it in a minute, but tell us about the, the, the advantages of what, how you transfuse in the military setting. So we, of course, carry product broken down into its constituent parts, and increasingly in more austere settings, we're using lyoplas, which is freeze-dried plasma that we reconstitute. But as Jonathan has said, we have access to a walking blood bank, an emergency donor panel, and everybody who goes out, goes away, is pre-screened for bloodborne viruses. They have to take their anti-malarial pills if we're in a malaria area. And it is, you know, Captain Jones can donate to private blogs. Uh, Sergeant Wilson can have blood from Corporal Jones. And they're very closely matched. And there is something rather special about whole blood. <laughs> whole warm blood at that. <laughs> Warmed whole blood. <laughs> But in, in, the, in the civilian setting, obviously, we, we don't have access yet. To, is there any tendency, Jacob? What, what is the advantage of giving whole blood to these patients? And what are the challenges in the again, civilian again, setting? Again, you know, we have to acknowledge that patients, they bleed whole blood. Mm. So it's kind of obvious that if you transfuse them to something that is really, really close to being the same as they lose, it can be put into the best solution. The challenge is that we don't have much evidence to support whole blood, especially in the civilian setting. In the military setting, you can have it fresh, warm. It's actually most active the first 48 hours, and after that, we do not know what happens to the blood. Uh, there's a lot of international centers that actually have implemented cold-stored whole blood. Um, we have two randomized control trials showing potentially in a, a small benefit in cardiac surgery in children, and we have a trauma trial not showing a benefit. So there's ongoing trials right now. But many centers have implemented this because it's easy, it's ready to go, it's in a liquid phase, you don't have to kind of prepare it like a freeze-dried product and so on. So it's, of course, obvious. The challenge is, from a blood banking pers perspective, we don't know how it affects our patients. So we, in my mind, we have to acknowledge that we can actually affect the product by storing it at a cold store. Mm. Our Norwegian colleagues have done a stu study in cold store platelets, and, and the platelets are pivotal to this. Mm. They've actually showed that if you cold store platelets within a week, mm. it's equal to an, our na normal standard plated product. If you store it for two weeks, you increase time in ventilators, increase time in ICU mm. by a factor of two. And that's potentially concernedly because you actually affect the pulmonary function of the patient. So again, we have to, in my mind, wait for the random control trial. But if we do see there's a beneficial effect for our patients, the Danish blood banks have to step up mm. and prepare this product. Mm. And that will be a challenge to the blood banks in yeah. Denmark. But what about and this stuff, uh, Lyoplast, this is, uh, I think a lot of you probably heard about it. Is it, is it as good? What's the, you know, we, we're giving coagulation factors, basically, this is it as good as giving plasma? Is, is dry? Does it, does it lose its effectivity when you restitute it, or what's the, uh, what's the score? It's actually there? quite good, and actually yeah. there's a French study by the, uh, on French freeze-dried plasma that's actually showing us that it can potentially uh, be better than a standard FFP in the pre setting okay. because you treat the trauma-induced coagulopathy potentially better. The challenge is that... that uh, we all like to have a liquid products ready to go, and you have to be ready and think 
the product in in a freestyle form as a part of your strategy. You have to think that you have to prepare this, and it takes a couple of minutes. Mm. Yeah. And so, so you have to p take it in as a part of your strategy, treating the patient by implementing it in there. Yeah, excellent. So basically, what we got these fluids, we got we in the demo, we got blood uh, on the on the helicopters, yeah, on the uh, yep, yep. RBCs. And, have, and the what? RBC, RBC yeah. as a, a new type of plasma called liquid plasma that yeah. is never frozen plasma, and then we have the freestyle plasma. So the Danish Hem Service is actually. Uh, a little like a flying blood bank, more mm. than emergency services, in my mind. And they have six products. That's just to challenge the hemp's colleagues. <laughs> Excellent. And the, and the products <laughs> that... Uh, <laughs> you've seen one out there. The products that we shouldn't be giving... <clears throat> what, what worsens the bleed? What, what shouldn't we be giving these patients? The surgeon knows. The surgeon knows. Thank you. Water. Water. <laughs> Water. Yes. <laughs> so crystalloids and colloids avoidance. Yeah. Worse than the coagulopathy. Yeah. Okay. The next slide is a, is a picture of a, a drug. And uh, is, it's in the medical community, this drug has split, uh, has been more divisive than probably Trump and Brexit put together because there's been a massive east-west divide on this, on where we should begin this. Um, Emma, you know this drug. Tranexanamic acid. Yeah. yeah no, it's a drug. It's one of the few drugs I actually know something yeah. about. <laughs> and uh, the evidence for giving it, Jacob, we start by the, the trauma patients, the group of patients we're talking about when they're having the bleed. What, is, what are the evidence that it works? Are yeah, we have, I think we have more than 700,000 patients randomized in different trials, perioperative setting, trauma, postpartum hemorrhage. And we have strong evidence to support that it improves survival in, in trauma, hemorrhage, and in traumatic brain injury. So we have evidence to support its use. So it's been standard of care since 2010 mm. in, in bleeding. And, and last couple of years, it's also been standard of care for patients with suspected traumatic brain injury. Yeah. Any objections? That's a shame. If you want to ask questions, just pop your hand up. We've got some runners who can come and uh, take them from you. It's Good. really interesting what you say about the divide is TXA is still not terribly popular in America. Mm. It's actually quite fun because, you know, uh, from the civilian setting, you know, the U.S., they were not part of the initial trials, and that's probably the primary concern. Mm -hmm. This was a uh, crash two trial. It was a U.K.-driven study. It was uh, collaborators in many countries uh, outside the U.S., and, and the U.S. colleagues, the trauma surgeons, were primarily concerned about the standard of care in the U.K., mm -hmm. in Denmark, in Scandinavia, in Europe. Mm. And that's why they kind of argumented that TXA is, is not a drug to be used in the U.S. because we all centers outside more or less have another standard of care. Mm. But it has moved a lot, and especially the U.S. military implemented this full-time. It's been there for some years, uh, one gram of training exam and acid bleeding trauma, but now it's there, two grams for all patients bleeding, for all patients with suspected TBI, and that's to be used unseen by the military personnel, pre-hospital personnel, and so on. So in the military U.S. setting, it's there. It's been there for a couple of years. Okay. Are there any patient groups, and we're talking about bleeding patients here, who are where you shouldn't be using it? Yes. No. <laughs> we, Let's start with you. <laughs> there is a uh, study, HALT study, that's uh, examined for the upper GI bleeding. So that's, that's not the, in trauma, not in trauma. No. So there is... They don't recommend giving it to suspicion of upper gear bleeding. I know that Jakob doesn't mm. really agree with that study. Uh, but uh, as surgeons with upper gear bleeding, we're not that happy of giving it uh, TK. Okay. You know, the whole study was a great study. Again, the CRES 2 group kind of implemented a large randomized control trial. Mm. I think one of the learnings from, from, from this study was that TXA cannot close holes. You know, if you have an upper GI bleeding, you have a hole. Either it's a variceal bleed or it's a hole in the stomach bleeding. So TXA cannot stop that. There was no concerns. Of course, there was a kind of un accidental finding about thromboembolic complications. But again, this study didn't have the power to, to see these complications. This is, in my mind, an accidental finding. We have no knowledge about side effects of TXA. So in trauma, going back to trauma in, in TBI, I'm not concerned at all. Uh, if you have the relevant patient. So if you have the patient with suspected bleeding intracranial, if you have the patient bleeding from a pelvic fracture, limb fractures, potentially torso bleeding, 
I would be concerned at all. Yeah. But the reason why I say it is also because if you go to a hospital with a surgeon, you will be faced with that, with that uh, idea that, okay, are you sure you want to give it? So, so that's something some, you have to discuss sometimes mm. and, uh, because they've heard that study. Okay, mm. good, good comment. Right, this is um, the patient now being moved from the pre-hospital setting and is coming to the trauma bay. Now, how do we create uh, order out of chaos? We have a normal, minimal uh, number of, pay, number of uh, medical staff turning up for a trauma on call. It's about 12. They come from different, different specialities. They have different goals. They have different uh, objectives. Kate, how, how, do, how do these teams function? Because it all looks from the outside. Of there. There's a lot of people doing a lot of things, and there's a... Uh, yeah. I think the way a trauma team works can be so utterly, utterly variable. Some hospitals, it just seems to work and it seems to happen. Because bear in mind, you know, you heard Chris talking about real teams and pseudo teams. When I turn up to trauma team lead, I don't know who I'm going to be working with that night or that day. And I think the real question is how you build that team from a disparate bunch of individuals, some of whom won't actually have met each other before, to get them into a team that will perform well to look after the patient. I think that's probably my biggest challenge as a trauma team leader. Mm. Mm. Well, how do you solve that? I introduce myself and I mm. ask them their names mm. and what they do and what bit of the patient management they would like to do. That's a good start. And yeah. it yeah. seems to work. And which background music did you introduce yourself with? I used the Imperial March, actually. Yeah. Darth Vader. <laughs> You should have been a surgeon. <laughs> I was before I started anaesthetics. Oh, that's the. <laughs> there is the reasoning. Excellent. So yeah, so training. Does, do any of you guys at your institutes record these and use them to debriefing, or is it a discussion we've had many times? Uh, well, I, yeah. I had a year at Shock Trauma in Baltimore, which is North America's busiest, tra busiest trauma center, and they have fixed cameras over every recess bay. So the footage can be used for debriefing uh, in a sort of real time looking at the footage, but there are a lot of consent issues elsewhere. Mm. Okay. We have the opportunity here in yeah. our tra trauma bay. It was developed like that and we used it in the beginning, but there's some legal concerns, yeah. both for, from, from the people, uh, from the personnel taking part in the team, but also, of course, for the patients. So, so this is not used here no. because of legal concerns. Yeah. Okay. Right, um, surgeon comes in the trauma bay, you see blood on the floor. And four more. And four more. What, what on earth are you thinking about? What's yeah. the four more and how do you find out? The, 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 the thing that's the surgeon's biggest task here is to, to find the bleed and to stop the bleed. And uh, we, we, we don't like think, to think too much, surgeons. We, so uh, it's very important to have a system and therefore the blood on the floor and four more. If you have a blood on the floor, then it's the big C. Then it's a finger, it's a tourniquet, it's a gas, or it's, a, it's something mm. to stop the bleeding. And otherwise, you should uh, look for bleeding in the thoracic cavity, in the abdominal cavity, including retroperitoneal. That's mm -hmm. the big ba black box, mm. the retroperitoneum. And then it's the pelvis, and of course, the, 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 the femur uh, bones and mm. the humerus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, blood on the floor and formal is a good yeah. concept, a, a good thought to have in your mind. Me, can you help here? At last. <laughs> <laughs> At last, yeah. This is definitely my part of the speciality, but one of the things in, uh, about the radiology workup is that this is getting so familiar that all this the X-ray, the E-FAST, and the primary CT scan is mainly performed directly with the clinicians. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in fact, uh, as a radiologist, we first come in a bit later in the scenario. Uh, but we love when they're there mm. and asking questions. Uh, what has happened and what are you doing here? And Emma, did you find anything? <laughs> we love you down there in the trauma bay. And that's exactly why we also implemented it for our team here at this hotel, that the radiologists on, on duty have to be present in the trauma bay uh, to be knowing of all these, like uh, pre the CT scan is done, mm. what does the X-ray look like? What is the result of the EFAST mm. and so on? Mm. Uh, and of course, needs to take up a, uh, or hear the clinical indications for the CT scan and be present there. Yeah, excellent. Mm. One of the things we see often is these patients who are coming in um, with high energy trauma, multiple injuries. And there's a strategy that has been, well, for 20 years ago, what we were doing, we were taking these patients to theater and we were operating them for hours on end, called something called definitive surgery, um, which gave rise to more bleeding, more coagulopathy. There's been a paradigm shift in this as well, and one of the concepts is called damage control. 
And that is a naval concept, I believe. And I think you're more than well placed to tell us what is damage control in the broad sense of the word before we go into the details. Damage control in, is of naval origin. And when a ship is hit by a missile or by a torpedo or by a bomb, ideally you want to keep the ship afloat because it is far safer for the ship's company to be on a ship that is still floating than having abandoned it into the life rafts. And a ship that still floats can probably still fight as well. And so anybody who goes to sea in the merchant navy or, the, or in the military will be trained in damage control concepts, firefighting, stopping floods, leak stopping. We're all trained in it. And mm. this is where this expression has come from. Yeah. So as a temporary measure to carry on try and carry on the normal functionality, but at the cost of the year, you've obviously lost something, but you're, you're still alive, you're still going. And in the uh, damage control resuscitation setting here, there is two pillars that are holding it up. One is damage control anesthesia, and one is damage control surgery. And damage control anesthesia, I think we'll come back to it, Jacob, but it's, uh, and Kay, but it's something that uh, we'll talk about in a minute. But damage control surgery, because that is interesting, because that is, that is not just the surgeon's decision, is it? No, it's a teamwork. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, and, and damage control surgery is actually, we want, we, we're not happy to say it, but in damage control surgery, we want to leave the OR as fast as we can. Because as you can see in the picture, when we have the patients in the OR, we have a patient that is, uh, is physically abnormal, is a severe distress, hypertensive, tachycardic, acidotic. And as you can see, we're lying there. We have no clothes on it. We open the abdomen, it gets colder for every minute when you're down there. So we want to get out there. And the thing we want to do, and we're allowed to do, it's very easy. We want to stop the bleed, stop the contamination, close the abdomen temporarily, and get to Jonathan, to yeah. the ICU. Yeah. And this is, uh, Jakob, this is one of the, the things we're working against. And, and couples quite nicely in where you say you want to do it as quickly as possible. Can you just explain why, how does that link into this slide? Yeah, because as a, this is actually what we try to prioritize in damage control resuscitation for the surgeon to stop the bleeding and the contamination for the anesthetist and the radiologist to, to kind of prioritize to stop the coagulopathy. Coagulopathy is potentially one of the factors that can increase the mortality uh, really much. Mm -hmm. uh, go, does it go along with, uh, uh, you know, acidosis, hypothermia, then you have the lethal triad here. Mm -hmm. And now we have learned that we have been better and better at, at focusing on this, at treating this. Uh, so now we have new pillars in there, uh, hi hyperkalemia, hypercalcemia, things that we have to focus. So again, dynamics control anesthesia uh, is about kind of making sure that the patient is alive, uh, listening to the physiology of the patient and trying to keep the patient there, not developing too much acidosis, hyperthermia, coagulopathy. And you introduced this uh, concept as was for 15 years ago now. And this is a picture, a messy picture, but some of the things that are uh, on this slide you've been, I mean, could you quickly just tell us, you know, what's, what's cows have got to do with temperature? What's that thing up in the top right corner? I think the first thing is to remember that clear fluids is not for bleeding patients, that's for cooking pasta. Okay. <laughs> and the next point is to use the blood products and have them available to you. So again, go talk to your blood banks, ensure that you have them in the London HEMS, you have them in national HEMS, your ambulance services, so on. Um, uh, but again, when you use those in blood products, you need to remember what is a blood product. Blood product is a blood product where you have citrate in there. And that's why the uh, uh, calcium actually is redu reduced in these patients. That's because of the tissue, the injury, the hypoxia. Uh, you can uh, decrease high, uh, calcium level. But also when you start to use blood products, calcium should be a pivotal part of your resuscitation. Mm -hmm. um, temperature again, Warming both the fluids, that's the blood products, and, and also the patient is extremely mm -hmm. important in this. Yeah. So again, it's a concept of listening to the physiology and making sure that the patient is actually yeah. uh, not getting any worse. Yeah. We're listening to the physiology. On a scale of my patient's dead, my patient's alive, <laughs> where are we, Mikael? <laughs> Somewhere. Oh. Uh, somewhere probably on the lower third of uh, <laughs> fifth. A good observation. This is um, this patient we're pouring fluids in. Emma's performing her laparotomy. She's packed the liver. She's packed the spleen. Um, Kate, you're worried. You're very worried. This is uh, almost a, it is a peri-arrest. 
What, what, are the, what are your thoughts and what are your actions here? Recognising the patient is sick as shit is absolutely <laughs> essential. But what is even more important is communicating to the surgeon who might actually be really quite task-focused and the rest of the operating theatre team that this patient is sick as shit. Mm. Yeah. Because everybody needs to know that this patient is actually on a downward spiral at the moment and what do we need to do to try and improve them. It might be that we've missed a source of bleeding so far. I might need the porter to be running up and down to the blood bank to get lots more product for me. There's something that we're missing here if we have turned the tap off. But I suspect with this patient, there's probably a source of bleeding somewhere else. Yeah. Emma replies there is the tide is coming in, the bowels are floating out the abdomen, there's blood everywhere. What, what is your major concern with this patient? Because we, we've got to do something. You're, you're, you're infusing via rapid transfusion massive amounts of blood and nothing's happening. What could you do? I, I, the thing I have to do now, I'm in deep shit, as you mm. say. I'm, I, I, I'm oh, maybe not in my, I'm not in my comfort zone, I think, at <laughs> this moment. But now I have to have proximal control. Mm. This is my major, major task at the moment, because I can't focus on the, the vessel bleeding at the moment. I have to go more close to the heart to get a, a clam or a hand mm. on our water. Okay. So basically, what, we're, we're in a situation now where we need to radically stop the bleeding. We need to do it now, here and now. And the reason being, we need to get perfusion up to the main organ, which is important now, and that's the brain. So you're doing central control. Yeah, and, then, and how do you do it? Yeah, you can do it uh, in the abdomen, in the, yeah. in the aorta, in the hiatus. But you can also do a, a left side trochotomy because it can sometimes be easier if your mm. lesion is very, very high in the aorta. Or mm. if I have Mikkel. <laughs> 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 and I have a hybrid uh, award, then, then it could be an idea, but at this moment might, might not be the best idea. Yeah. Because we'll we'll save sleeping. him for the next slide, yeah. because the patient survived, you did the central, you, you removed the spleen that was pissing blood everywhere and everything's okay now, so you're out of the shit zone and he's, back, he's now in the intensive care ward, a very nice place to be, um, free coffee and everything else. What is this thing on the patient now? What is it? This is an external fixation. We got, we got the orthopedic surgeon down. How, the, how do they stop the bleeding with that? They, they, uh, they, it was a pelvic, pelvic fracture, yeah. and it didn't stop the bleeding. But, but, but the, the thing that 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 does is actually to to reduce the volume in the pelvic and to to you know to to make the the bowl smaller, and then to compress the the venous plexus and over the sacrum. Okay. Yeah. I call you. <sighs> Shit, <laughs> I'm not in my comfort zone. You're not. <laughs> no, I'm in few, transfusing this patient. Pressure the falling, tachycardia, please help. And then I say the F word. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, well, Mika starts with M. Yeah. yeah. The, the, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because this, the, he's bleeding from his, his pelvis and it's probably maybe an arter, arter, arterial bleeding yeah. that won't itself. So yeah. then we could use you. Maybe. I know what you're As, thinking. Yeah. Uh, exactly like always. We, we sleeping back home. We are called in last and uh, we haven't been notified about any of these traumas because that's the uh, <laughs> settings, the current settings that we have right now that we are like uh, uh, having calls on uh, from back home. Mm -hmm. So we are first when the shit hits the fan <laughs> being called up and asked if we can do something with a coil. Uh, it is very interesting because stop the bleed, as this lecture is called, is what we do in our daily work always. And the coil is just one of the tools we have in, in, in my toolbox. Uh, the interesting part is that we are actually doing a lot of the similar stuff that the surgeons do. We just do it from within instead. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore we can hit the target, we can see the uh, by knowing uh, the vascular structures, we can find where the bleeding is coming from. However, we would very much like to have a CT scan in a patient like this before because the diagnostic settings in, in, the, in the angiography that we're doing in the lab, in the, in the catheter-based labs, is not very accurate. So we would like to have a CT scan to direct this procedure so we can speed up the hemostatic uh, coiling parts. I'm going to be very focused now because we've only got four minutes left. When this pa if, you, if I've got a patient who, needs to, who I can think maybe will benefit from coiling, how much blood loss? Because this thing in the middle, yeah, this is your what you want to get an eye on. This is a, a blush where the blood's coming out, or the contrast, sorry, is coming out. What, how much bleeding does there need to be before this is relevant? If I said to you, yeah, we transfused the patient with one portion of red blood cells yesterday, can you help? I would say that you have to call Jakob first. Okay, so five portions yesterday. Then, maybe, but it all depends on like uh, the, the other states of the, uh, the patients. Stable. Stable. 
Yeah. But does do we think that it's going the right way or the wrong way? Yeah. It's been the last five days, five, five pours of blood every day. And do we have a CT scan that is proving where the patient is bleeding from? No. Then we don't really have a target to mm. actually embolize. Okay. And that's quite often the issue that we have some patients that are bleeding intermittent. And then when we go down to the CT scan, we don't actually figure out exactly mm. where they're bleeding from. No. Or if it's a natural bleeding or venous bleeding. Mm. And the parts that we can mainly assist with is, is, is coiling the, the okay. arterial bleedings. So basically it's pick up the phone to you and ask you, give you, tell you what's going on, and you can say, yeah, we can or we can't. Exactly. Great. One of the, one of the things we, we this, is, um, this is what you play with on a daily basis. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. One of the interesting things when, we're, when you're working in a multidisciplinary environment is that when you get talking to each other, you find out that some people are doing some things in one environment, others are doing the other environment, and they're actually doing the same thing but under different names. And this is actually just to focus on this, this is an interesting story Mikkel told me. Do you want to just yeah. tell us very quickly what it was? You and Jakob had a chat about this. Well, I think it was in, what, in 2014 or so that Jakob called me up and asked about if I could come and perform a report on the uh, animal uh, course that uh, you, were, you guys were having. And I was a bit in doubt what this report was, and he was so <laughs> confident that I would know all about it <laughs> until I studied and figured out that that is what I call an uh, aortic occlusion balloon instead, <laughs> that I actually use every single day, but I've never yeah. heard about this concept of report. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is basically just the tools that we are using in a different environment. Yeah. Uh, but this whole concept, this balloon or this report, actually started a complete concept of endovascular treatment and trauma, so using all these techniques that we have in a hybrid situation that can assist stopping the bleeding, both in hospital, but it's also pushing more and more forward to the uh, pre-hospital settings. Do, do, is there a play, this, this repo for all of that is just sticking a balloon up in an artery and blowing it up and you stop the bleed? It's, it's no more than that. I mean, do we use it, Jacob? Okay. No, no, no we, we don't use it yet. You know, you do, potentially. Uh, in my mind, you know, you have a lot of evidence out there showing this actually kills patients uh, because much of the evidence is actually associated with uh, kind of increased mortality. Fortunately, uh, the UK colleagues are running a randomized controlled trial, the UK Reboa trial. So, so very soon we will know more about this, but the challenge is to find the right patient. This is a temporizing measure. This buys you time where there is non-compressible torso hemorrhage. And it shouldn't really be thought of as anything other than mm. that. And we, for example, we carry it in the military to use, and I've just been away to see with our aircraft carrier. We have one operating table. If I have two patients who both need surgery for non-compressible torso trauma, one of them, the least sick, will probably get the reboa, and the most sick will go onto the table. Great. Um, to wrap up, I just want, Jakob, you have been the orchestrator of this. Uh, the, the title's in Danish, uh, for those mm. who don't realize it. Um, can you quickly tell us about this amazing service for yes. bleeding patients? Since, yeah. since 2014, we have challenged the blood banks in order to ensure that you have this uh, support when you're working in the clinical environment in Denmark, that when you're a team of surgeons, radiologists, anesthetists working with the bleeding patients, the blood banks would like to take part. So you actually, in Denmark, now we have you know, a uh, specialist in hemostasis and transfusion medicine 24-7 available to you. And that's also, again, to acknowledge that, that there's someone out there that can help you, not only in the capital of Copenhagen, but also in the rest of Denmark. This is the numbers that you can actually call 24-7 to get support from the blood bank. Mm, thank you. It's an amazing achievement. You can just pick up the phone and get help whether you are, whether, wherever you are in the country. So this is the last slide. And obviously, these are my take-home messages. You might have got something totally different out of this talk. Um, basically, I think that for me, the paradigm shift is CABC is something I think we should take, you should take home. Those who've got bleeding kits, take them home. Talk to your family and friends about it. De uh, take the horror out of blood. It's not that scary. Tell them that. So maybe they could come to save a life that way. Another thing is, and I think it's reflected in the panel we've had here, the multidisciplinary approach to bleeding patients. I mean, this is just, it speaks for itself. And then the last uh, take message, I think, for me, is, is, which has been amazing, is the, diff, the, the total radical change in transfusion medicine over the last 15 years. I stood in an intensive care unit 15 years ago, and we had a patient who was bleeding to death. We got one, she got one pack of red blood. So she got two, she got three, she got four, she got five. And when we got up to number 15, one of my colleagues said to me, should we not be giving some thin fluids now? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, let's give us a 5% glucose. 
And to think that was only 15 years ago, and to think what has been established through the work of the likes of Jacob and Pear is absolutely phenomenal. So I hope you take that home with you as well, these massive transfusion protocols. We didn't have time to come into it, unfortunately, but there was also a lot with viscoelastic assays, multi-plate analysis, and of course, the bleeding, uh, the number of telephone numbers, you can always ring to them and ask their advice. I'd like to round up here and say thank you so much for you guys, for your time and energy. It's been a real pleasure really active uh, contribution, and I think we'll round off there. Thank you very much.